Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to one of the ECSSA parallel sessions covering research priorities for electric, connected and automated mobility. My name is Caroline Zachius and I will moderate this session today. So before we will start with the program, I would just like to clarify that as I guess in the whole FX conference already, the questions can be asked to all the presentations using the chat window. And then we will collect the questions and the speakers will have an opportunity to answer them orally directly after their presentation. So let us now briefly have a look at the session program. Some um, of the main topics during the conference were the current and continuous changing challenges for the ECS community. And in this session, we will further focus on challenges as well as research priorities for the application field of mobility. So as we can see in the agenda, the session will start with an introduction to the Mobility Lighthouse, followed by a presentation of the SRIA chapter and the underlined ECA mobility challenges. Afterwards, we will hear about research priorities for connected shared mobility. And um, at the end, we will highlight the smart infrastructure for the development and evaluation of automated functions. So I would like to warmly welcome the speaker of the first presentation my colleague Benjamin Wilsch from VDI VDIT. Benjamin is scientific consultant in the Department of Future Mobility and Europe of VDI VDIT in Berlin in Germany. His activities mainly concern future trends in transportation and include project and program support for, the, for several German ministries. And he's as well the project coordinator, coordinator of the Cosmos project, which is driving the mobility lighthouse for um, yeah, the evaluation of the European ecosystem for electric connected and automated driving. So please, Benjamin, we are looking forward to your speech. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present the mobility lighthouse here today. Um, I hope my slides are visible. not i would just ask for a short um hint from the organizers that i will get started to not not to lose any time um yes so um the mobility e lighthouse is of course all about the application field of mobility it is one of three lighthouses um initiated installed by the excel joint undertaking and the main objective if we uh, had to put it in one sentence is, is as we have it here on the slide strengthening the ecosystem for electric connected and automated mobility. Um, there are a couple of additional logos on this slide. Um, I'd like to point uh, particularly to the one of the Cosmos project, which is the CSA behind the Mobility E Lighthouse. So, as I said, um, for the Mobility E Lighthouse, we are looking at um, mobility applications and classically, of course, then if we talk about the value chain, um, we would be talking about the automotive value chain shown here from the level of ECS to the application and that classically we would have been the car. And for that, for the automotive value chain, we have in Europe, of course, um, a very traditional and, and strong automotive industry. Um, which is, however, now seeing um, a lot of radical changes that have been discussed already at length um, throughout the FX conference these past um, two days. And um, that's why these changes, which I'll get into in a moment, um, have, have, of course, engendered um, several effects, consequences for the automotive field. And that is um, also a reason why we talk for the Mobility Lighthouse, not any, any longer only about the automotive as the end application, but the full range of mobility solutions that are on offer. Um, electrification and automation are, of course, um, longer lasting trends and um, that have shaped this field, this area. 
and these have been then joined over the last year um, by the effect of the COVID pandemic um, with ensuing changes, uh, as well as, of course, a stronger societal focus on green solutions and, and the importance um, of the climate change. Um, to highlight some one, one of the more recent changes then, I'd like to show here a result from the report of UITP and Arthur D. Little um, with an early analysis of potential effects of the COVID pandemic um, and the lockdowns, of course, that were and uh, are still being implemented to control the pandemic. Um, yeah, in the very first weeks and months of lockdowns, we saw um, an increase in um, motor vehicle use and a decrease in the use of public transport. Um, of, um, when, while we also have to respect, of course, that initially with a strong lockdown, all modes of transportation went down. But we see then that as lockdowns were um, easened or um, in, in China, from China we see reports where lockdown has is no longer necessary due to the positive run of the pandemic there, that in fact, uh, longer mid or long term effects are expected to increase the use of individual uh, mobility, motor vehicles, and um, unfortunately, probably also the use of public transport while new transport modes, um, electric scooters, um, as well as classical bicycling and electrical uh, cycling can see a long term increase in usage. There are then other effects um, looking not exclusively at mobility, but of course, an increase in home office work has um, seen cities or the way people travel through cities become um, more multipolar. So um, while we had rural and um, pendular cities already before, multipolar um, cities are becoming a, a reality increasingly. And accordingly, we need suitable mobility solutions that should be provided. Uh, another trend I would like to highlight is the need to look at the mobility system as as a system, as a system of um, smaller system units. So we see on the left hand side here the vehicle where we already have a combination of a very many components um, where a systemic approach and perspective is already required. And on the right hand side, looking then at the entire system, vehicles coming together, the need to coordinate them. Um, of course, um, yeah, a need for connectivity and coordination of um, individual transport modes. Okay, so yes, um, this slide was to illustrate the starting point, the classical automotive value chain with um, the automotive um, application at the end of the value chain. On this slide, I had shown some changes that these, this value chain has um, undergone over the past few years, and particularly of course, those um, introduced by increasing levels of electrification and automation. Then to discuss the COVID effects, this was the effects on different modes of transportation, where, um, as I was saying, the long term effects are expected to be what we can learn, what we can see from um, China thus far, that the use of individual cars will increase. Uh, public transport will probably also in the long term see a reduced usage, um, but new transport modes such as electric scooters um, have increased and this can also have a long lasting effect um, while cycling has also increased in usage. And on the lower half of this slide, um, the point I was making about multipolar cities becoming um, a reality increasingly, given the increase in home office work. And this to highlight um, the aspect of the or the need to look at the mobility system as an a entire system 
And if we talk, for example, about the efficiency, um, looking again at the implications of the Green Deal, then a systemic view is required to really um, gain as much efficiency as possible. So if we look now back again, um, starting from the more classical uh, automotive value chain, the car at the end, then we have shown here on this slide. Just need to shift something here, sorry. Um, the classical application um, here shown already for an electrified car with classical components that has been joined now on the application end, upper side of this graph by new modes of transportation. For example, fleets of automated vehicles, connected vehicles, on-demand shuttles, but also um, not limited to road transport, drones or delivery robots, um, also new potential applications that need to be um, provided on the ECS side with new components, giving the required levels of connectivity, um, cybersecurity, for example, or allowing the necessary extent of data processing um, for AI applications. Um, furthermore, we have, and this is shown above the graph here, not only the technical aspects to consider, but increasingly also non-technical aspects, economic, legal, hu and human factors, as well as societal factors, um, where we see, for example, um, now with the COVID pandemic or the implications of the Green Deal, how priorities shifting in, within society um, also have direct effects on the mobility value chain. And there are, of course, um, then push and pull um, factors, elements between these two ends shown here of the mobility value chain. Uh, for example, new applications requiring new components from the ECS side. Still having some minor issues with the presentation, but I, I hope it's visible for everybody now. Um, and this is where the Mobility Lighthouse comes in. This new and increasingly complex and diverse ecosystem of mobility solutions um, needs to be connected in some form. And the Mobility Lighthouse is there to provide a, the networking and collaboration platform where all stakeholders along this value chain, but also stakeholders from the non-technical fields can, can come together to discuss research prior, priorities, for example, or actions that should be undertaken to accelerate the implementations of these mobility solutions that can answer some of the societal challenges that we're facing. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the Cosmos project is there as a CSA to drive the Mobility e Lighthouse. It is um, being carried out by the project partners shown in blue on the map here and supported by the associated partners um, in the green boxes on the map and really works to analyze the mobility ecosystem to identify research priorities and gaps perhaps in strategies to check project work and strategic documents for coherency um, and in particular to support um, exchange and collaboration between the stakeholders of this ecosystem. The Lighthouse is further supported by a, an advisory service composed in part of also contributors to the Cosmos project but um, even more stakeholders and as you can see here from very diverse organizations covering the entire mobility value chain. I will have to make up for some lost time due to the presentation issues. I won't go into too many details therefore on these lighthouse projects, um, which are also an important part of the lighthouse because this is where direct um, exchange can take place between different projects. Um, also projects that have already ended can present their best practices um, but also these projects can have joint dissemination activities. And one of those being their presentation um, as part of the FX conference uh, yesterday and today. And um, that's why for further information on these projects, I would like to point to the Mobility e Lighthouse booth um, accessible where further 
information on each of these projects can be found. In the time that remains, I would like to use to highlight two activities of the Mobility e Lighthouse as, it, as supported by the Cosmos project from the two components of the project, which are strategy development and network support. For the network support, first of all, just as an example, we have every year the ECA 2030 conference, where you can see the program of this year's conference, which has, um, was already, has already taken place a month ago. Um, but just to show um, what kind of elements you can expect from an ECA 2030 conference, where we have um, keynote presentations from stakeholders, again, along the mobility value chain. We have keynotes on urgent priorities that need to be addressed. This year it was decarbonization, validation and connectivity, but also panels to get the conversation started. Um, and again, this year's example on the connection of European partnerships was, a, was one panel. Uh, and another example would be the comparison of European and national research priorities um, for which we also had a panel. Um, but an important aspect um, or part of those events are, are always exchange with a wide and um, diverse stakeholder circle. And that's why we always have an interactive element in the ECHO 2030 conferences. And we also will have one to, later today in the afternoon at 3.30 with an interactive session on research priorities and actions. And here I can also provide first insight. This is from the strategy development part of the project where we started originally with seven urgent priorities shown here and have refined those on the one hand by the selection of the Lighthouse project, highlighting these five urgent priorities shown here in their distribution, but also in surveys at events and now increasingly online. Um, and here I would like to show, and as I, I just mentioned, there will be further opportunity for discussion of these priorities and the actions that follow from them in the afternoon. Um, but just uh, to give an idea, this was the result of a workshop at the end of last year with priorities, subtopics for each of the seven urgent priorities. And if we look then at the result of this year's workshop last month, um, we see the topics here in green that have been added in this step um, designed to validate um, the completeness of the research priorities as well. And we see here also one of the trends um, clearly in these new research priorities, um, which is the need to look at the entire mobility system, uh, where we see under connectivity a new priority to have a continuum and redundant network, um, but also in decarbonization, this idea of um, the importance of achieving extrinsic energy efficiency by system integration. Yes, and with that, um, I have reached the end of my presentation and I would like to point you to the Mobility E website on one hand, which you can see here, it's mobilityE.eu. And amongst other things, um, you will find their information about the Lighthouse project projects, Lighthouse activities, and an opportunity to complete a survey on research priorities. Um, and as I mentioned this afternoon, starting at 3.30, we will have an interactive workshop started with a keynote also on a particular uh, research priority in the field of validation. And then the majority of the workshop dedicated to um, verifying and um, adding to the research priorities, but also defining actions that should be taken or can be taken to accelerate the implementation deployment of electric connected and automated mobility solutions. And finally, the Mobility E Lighthouse virtual booth will also be um, available for the rest of today. Um, so with that, sorry for the technical difficulties and thank you for your attention. And also, if you want to get in touch, then write us an email at contact at mobilityE.eu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin, for the interesting talk. I'm afraid we don't have enough time for a question, so I would just straight go forward to our 
next presenters. However, I also want to stress that if there's any further yeah, need for discussion and any yeah, further interest in the Mobility e Lighthouse and its activities, please join the co-located workshop in the afternoon. So now I would like to give the floor to Michael Paul Weber from AVL List and Patrick Pieper from NXP Semiconductors to present the 3R Mobility Chapter. Mr. Paul Weber was appointed Director of Global Research and Technology Management in the AVL Instrumentation and Test System Division in 2012, he became head of development for the test system automation and control production line at EVL List, and he gained expert knowledge in embedded software development. Um, yeah. Michael serves as a vice president for the European Industry Association Artemis and as a vice chairman of the Excel Austria. He also serves as a member of the European Excel Steering Board. And finally, he holds lectures at the University of Applied Science, as well as at the University of Technology in Graz. And I will also just give a brief introduction to the other speaker of this um, presentation, Patrick. Patrick is the Director of Strategic Partnerships at NXP Semiconductors, <laughs> also since 2012. <laughs> He is running the Secretus project on security of autonomous systems with yeah, a big consortium of um, 69 partners from 12 countries throughout Europe. Patrick is chairman of the Penta Technical Expert Group since 2018, and he's member of also a member of the Artemis Steering Board since 2015. And of the Artemis Presidium since 2018. He's furthermore co-chair of the overall Excel strategic research agenda and is also co-chair of the chapter on transport and mobility. So please, Michael and Patrick, we are looking forward to hear your presentation. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, so thank you, Caroline. I will take a, so start, and will take Michael, a start and then Michael will take over. So if you can see the next slide, please. So, in fact, uh, what we have done is we have been looking at what is the 2050 vision towards mobility uh, in order to guide the developments which are needed in Europe in the domain of electronic components and systems. So, the first one is about the Green Deal, uh, where we are currently working on a 37.5% uh, reduction of CO2 in 2030 compared to 2021, and where we want to strive for a net zero CO2 emission in 2050. Second topic is road safety, where we want to go for a zero road fatalities and accidents scenario in 2050. Important is also inclusive mobility, so 90% reach of the people with special needs, whereas of today only 60% of the people with special needs are included in the mobility domain. And of course, last but not least, is to keep us competitive in Europe with the rest of the world and to keep technological leadership throughout the value chain in the mobility domain. Next slide, please. So we are currently on our way to improve for society and I've just taken one example, which is the zero accident scenario. If we look at manual driven cars today and we look at worldwide figures, we see that there are one, more than one million road fatalities annually. There is one accident every 23 seconds in the world. Also in Germany, uh, we are 3,275 road fatalities in Germany in 2018, already much better than the 20,000 in 1970, but still too much. Major causes of these are human errors. And of course, we would like to evolve towards autonomous driving in the future. And if we look to the autonomous accidents to date, there were 14 serious car crashes with autonomous cars and six uh, fatalities. And the major causes today are inferior sensing systems and human behavior outside of the vehicle. And that's why we need to work on future systems and improvements on these sensor environments and these controllers to make sure that the cars catch everything that is happening in the world. 
So please, next slide. So in terms of leadership and driving innovation in Europe, I think we can be proud to say that uh, in the semiconductors field, we have three European key players, uh, NXP, Infineon and ST Microelectronics, which are in the top five worldwide in terms of semiconductor uh, uh, sales and together count for $11.5 billion in 2018. Second point, in Europe we are very strong in our evolution towards autonomous driving and connected cars, which is a real booming market. If you look at the European uh, gross domestic product growth, this is average 2 to 3% per annum. Whereas if you look to car safety applications, autonomous driving and connected services, they are growing respectively with 28, 31 and 15%. So it's an area where we are strong and where we should keep strong uh, in further making technological progress and innovation. What is also important is that we see that the automotive developments are often also driving innovation in other domains. A lot of developments which are happening in the uh, semiconductors and software for autonomous cars is also used currently in industry, in energy, in battery management systems, in the health sector, in agri-food, in digital life and digital industry. So here I would like to uh, also emphasize the synergy with other uh, public-private partnerships. So uh, we are currently uh, involved in KDT, Key D Digital Technologies, where we are working on the building blocks, the electronic components, hardware, software, electronic subsystems, which are then used throughout the value chain towards the end application, towards the OEMs, and which are integrated in the products for end users like cars, bicycles, etc. Uh, and there are two other public-private partnerships, SICAM, which is Cooperative and Connected Automated Mobility, and we have 2.0, the first one taking care of really autonomous cars from a system perspective, from the car perspective, to zero, taking care of zero emission and CO2 reduction, and KDT making sure that the electronic components and systems are available. And you see also the synergies with the other domains where we are working together with quite intensively. And here I would like to conclude my part of the presentation and give the floor to Michael Polweber uh, for the remaining part. Thanks, uh, Patrick. So I hope you can hear me. You can I hear want, me. I want to go now into a little more detail about the different uh, challenges. The first challenge uh, is very much in, in sync with the European Green Deal. Uh, electronic components and systems are the, the basic building blocks required for electrification and sustainable alternative fuels for a CO2 neutral mobility. If you look uh, to the um, graphic uh, below, which I've taken from IHS, which indicates that the prediction is that in 2030, which is not too far from, from now, uh, more than 60% of the vehicles uh, sold will be electric or, or electrified vehicles, which, which means that we have to ensure that uh, we can, can provide this electronic and, and, and software building blocks, which uh, enables this transfer to this uh, CO2 neutral mobility. We have a more, more detailed uh, roadmaps, which I just show as an indication, but won't go into, into all the details, where we have identified uh, different goals which we have to achieve, shown in, in, in this, this uh, roadmap uh, on the slide on the right hand side. We do not uh, consider the CO2 and neutral mobility only on um, passenger cars and, and uh, on goods transport, but we want to extend that also in what we call CO2 neutral light mobility. And light mobility, we think these are uh, bikes, tricycle, wheelchairs, drones, uh, agricultural uh, devices, and, and there, there are many more which also contribute to, to the current uh, CO2 because they most are driven by combustion engines and, and they also have to be 
uh, converted to electrified and, and partially automated vehicles. The roadmap itself indicates that uh, we have the light mobility, uh, either electrified or in, in, in some cases where, where you need uh, long durations, for example, uh, for, for drones which, which fly over, over the sea for many hours, then also fuel cell based uh, mobility has to be uh, supported by our sensor components, by our uh, components which contribute or which, which uh, use AI on the, on the edge, controlling this, taking, uh, figuring out what, what, what the environment is and, and find out what, what's the best way to, to have the, the minimum uh, usage of, of energy. Third challenge goes into the, the goal for, for this uh, zero accident uh, uh, vision where we want to enable affordable automated and connected mobility. It also shall contribute to uh, the inclusive mobility because uh, our society gets elder and elder. Also, uh, the census from, from uh, our uh, citizens, they, they, they do not uh, stay that, that, that advanced over, over, over the lifetime. So we have to support them with figuring out what's, what's going on and, and, and taking care of, of the, the safety of, of our citizens. Uh, Automation in, in mobility is a very complex system and it requires our components and at very many different places. It starts uh, from, from the sensors, which, which more or less can convert what's, what's going on on the environment into some electrical signals, which then have to be uh, con converted using mainly uh, a, a lot of artificial intelligence, edge computing, into a perception so that we have a good understanding of what's going on in the environment. Then we have to communicate to the, the outside world to figure out what, what is doing the traffic uh, and, 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 and all, all the others. We have to know where uh, a vehicle, a truck, a drone uh, should go and convert it into a, a control strategy on path planning, behavioral planning, motion planning and then convert it into, again, mostly uh, electronic components where we influence steering, braking, uh, accelerating, decelerating. In addition, we have also to, to communicate to a lot of other electronic systems like uh, uh, adaptive suspension systems or a battery systems or a powering systems, whatever it is. The third challenge, is very much related to the, to the third challenge, which means we have to ensure that these systems can cope with any situations out, out there in a safe and, and, and secure manner, and in, in parallel also taking care of the comfort of, of now the, 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 the passengers, because also the driver in such a case gets a passenger. So we have to deal with validation and with certification. It's common understanding that such a certification and that such a validation cannot be done just on the road. You have to com combine virtual uh, versions of, of these automated systems, virtual versions of, of, of the traffic of the environment together with, with real components. And for this, also again, a roadmap is there where we, we are currently actively working in, uh, heavily working in level two plus, level four, which will continue to validation uh, certification for uh, level five systems and also of the integrated mobility or the extrinsic mobility as uh, Rainer states it. Which leads us to uh, challenge five, which is extending the mobility, not just to the, the, the different means to, to, to go from point A to point B, vehicles, trucks, uh, ships, uh, airplanes, but to take, uh, to take into account uh, two other dimensions. Uh, the, the, the one which is the multimodal mobility, so that you have different uh, best energy optimals uh, way how you, you go from point A to point B, 
And the second, you take into account all the, the rest of the traffic in cities, countries, interstates, road, which live, uh, leads us to an extrinsic energy optimum, which we have to fulfill, where we have now to take advantage and, and combine edge computing with cloud computing with a lot of com communication for which we uh, have to provide the, the components, the uh, software infrastructure, the software pieces for urban and long distance energy, um, optimal mobility systems for rural, as well as for a global energy op optimization. All of it we have put into a timeline. The timeline, as uh, already presented by Benjamin, is split into three parts. The short term, our short term goals, the mid term goals, and, and, and the long term goals. We have just uh, visualized uh, some of them. Uh, you find them into way more detail in the new version of the strategic research and innovation agenda. Okay, that's the, the overview about our content in the mobility chapter. Thank you very much, Patrick, Patrick and Michael. Unfortunately, it looks like there are no questions, but then I will go on and ask a question. So I will start with Patrick. Maybe you were showing at the beginning that the EU competitiveness is obviously a very important um, yeah, factor to take into account. So my question would be if there are already some specific concrete actions or ideas how to further push the EU competitiveness. Well, I think it's, I would say, a continuous battle uh, to win the innovation, uh, to make sure that you are uh, a market leader in certain domains and that you keep the market leadership. Uh, so it's not a matter of special programs or whatever. I think it's industry who has to stay competitive. It's universities and research institutes which have to be closely connected to what the industry is aiming at and the roadmaps being built in industry. And if you are working together very closely between industry, universities, research institutes, we can make sure that we uh, uh, win the right battle, so to speak, and that we stay a market leader in the domains we're strong in. And uh, my advice is really, let's make sure we get stronger in the areas we have already a certain strength instead of trying to fight a lost battle and make sure that the domains we're currently in, we stay market leader in. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So maybe one more question to Michael. We heard before already also in the Mobility e Lighthouse presentation that um, yeah, the importance of cross-sector collaboration and that we should not just stay within yeah, our one sector and also the need for um, horizontal connections. So my question would be this yeah, chapter that you were presenting is obviously now all about mobility and it's also already broadened from, I would say, an automotive perspective to a mobility perspective, but what are the opportunities to further also transfer solutions from the mobility sector to other sectors, for example, health, agriculture, or robotics? Yeah, uh, Caroline, thanks, thanks for the question. It's a really interesting question, and, and throughout uh, the, the work on our our chapter, we, we spend a lot of effort to to, to uh, get get uh, in in contact with with with, with other uh, communities like with with uh, the air truck, the equi community, but also with with uh, hydrogen and fuel cell, with battery communities, with IoT community, because. KDD is is uh, just pro uh, providing the building blocks for the, the, the products uh, we are working on. Uh, mobility systems, whether it's, it's a plane, a ship, a, a, a drone, a car, a truck, uh, requires more than just the electronics and, 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 and the software. It, it, it requires wheels, seats, uh, a, a chassis, and, and so on, in order to really provide something which is useful for the society. So, so we have to, to work in, in close contact. and. 
if you take it as if if you consider that uh, we are we are moving into more aut autonomous uh, systems, then all of a sudden there is a, a lot of, of of time available for the, the, the passengers, which which then uh, pose a lot, lots of additional opportunities. For example, in in the health area, that that you can add other sensors to the systems, for, which in in future maybe can. Do what what currently is, is going on in in a lot of different uh, countries where, where they, they want to to do do COVID checks for for more or less a, a big portion of, of the population. Maybe we, we can think about of systems that in future you do it while uh, going from point A to point B. It's done automatically without any without any. Uh, and, and annoyance to, to, to the passengers. And, and there are lots of other ideas around where we can combine now the, 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 these different domains using the, the, the advances in, in our control uh, electronic components and, and systems, the, the, the sensors, uh, edge computing, new, uh, new um, control algorithms, uh, uh, software advances. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, this answers That's my question. Thank you very much. We actually got now one last question from the audience. And I will just go ahead and whoever of you feels yeah, most addressed with the question, please um, answer it. So, one question was, would you comment on how do you see the synergies with other partnerships and would cloud or smart networks be relevant? So if, if I can, can, can answer, for sure, uh, there, there are lots of synergies because of the fact that, that uh, uh, we con consider three things. We consider the individual uh, the control in, 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 in cars, ships, and so on. But we have also to consider my, the, the, my, uh, the, the, the traffic mm -hmm. around and, and in influencing how the, the, the different traffic participants, uh, vehicles, uh, e-bikes, whatever, uh, take advantage of, of the, the, the precious good of, of, of road space and then time on, on the road, we, we can save another significant portion of, of energy. So this extrin extrinsic optimization we can do only if we also uh, communicate and, and heavily uh, in, interact, for example, with, with, with the people in, 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 in cloud computing. And another uh, aspect where cloud computing can help you, that in cloud computing you, you can share a huge amount of data where more or less uh, you, you have the information about the history and from the history you can predict, for example, how the traffic will be in, in, in the future, taking into account weather conditions, uh, time of day, uh, time of season and, and, and so on, which you can then use to find optimal strategies for individual vehicles, but also to, to interact with the other vehicles and then and find the most energy efficient uh, way how to, to uh, transport people, goods, in, 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 in the world. Yeah, thank if you I very much. Add to yeah. this, I think, uh, indeed, uh, if you look at future uh, mobility elements like cars, bicycles, trains, they are part of a bigger network. And uh, if you look also at the developments, we see more and more that, for example, uh, companies active in the 5G domain are working together with companies active in the automotive domain uh, to ensure to build some reconfigurable communications and radar stations, for example, in the future. So the different worlds are indeed merging together and uh, everyone can learn from everyone. And I think mobility is a very, I would say, a key innovation area uh, where, in fact, uh, the connection within the cloud, within the network can uh, stimulate further innovations. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the presentation and for these insights. So with this, I would like to go on with the next speaker, Rainer Jon from Infineon. 
Rainer received his diploma degree in electrical engineering from the Fachhochschule in Saarland in collaboration with the University of Metz in France. In 1984, he started his career with the Siemens, Siemens Semiconductor Group in Munich, where he worked in the field of automatic test system development. And this was followed by different other positions within the um, Siemens Group. In 1996, he joined the Siemens Semiconductors, the later IPO of Infineon Technologies, where he's still um, part of the company. In the year 2000, he further pursued his career in Taiwan, where he set up and managed the Infineon Silicon Foundry Taiwan office as the head of department for seven years. And at the present, right now, Rainer is in charge of the coordination of publicly funded research and development projects in the area of trustable AI for industrial and mobility applications, and also in the inspiration and management of research and development projects, mainly for electric mobility based on highly efficient propulsion perception and advanced control systems. So, Rainer, please. Very good. So thank you very much for inviting me and uh, to give the opportunity to talk about the electric connected automated and shared mobility. And uh, what does it mean? Convenient, affordable and safe to the, uh, to the destination. And on the other way, we had a lot of discussion about shared. Shared means maybe values and information sharing. It's, it's not directly to share a seat in a car. It means to take a look on the overall system. And there are some obstacles. When emissions needs to be reduced faster, when mobility service needs to be more personal, more effective, not more cars in the city, this is not anymore an option. Transportation cap capacity is limited for people and goods. Infrastructure development is limited. So we all know these obstacles uh, when it comes to a new street, to changing the infrastructure in the city. Traffic jam is created everywhere, even not by appropriate system knowledge. And mobility is not reach, reaching the social optimum. So we need a tremendous different view on mobility. And we need to transform it faster. For that, we need an exponential grow element. And this is something I would like to explain a little bit. This is consumption benefits of silicon carbide, MOSFETs versus silicon IGBTs. This is a courtesy of Mercedes. And what you see here is the inverter is giving us the opportunity, so the electrical system is giving us the opportunity to reduce the power consumption. But what you see, the power train and this or out the inverter is very stable. 28 uh, watt per kilometers. And if you look at the real drive, it's 32. The basic consumption is 100 compared with 157. And uh, if you look in the 400 volt power train, we get roughly about something 6.9%, 7%, the silicon carbide 7.7%. And even in the real drive, it's also something like a few percent. What is now the options or what is the question behind? What means intrinsically getting better? Intrinsically getting better is reducing this. This is what we tried over the years. So we get better and better and uh, we build more compact uh, systems, more compact electronics, more compact inverters. But the basic consumptions, the majority keep same. So, and the chances, if you compare the consumption with the VLTP cycle, with the real drive, we have a huge opportunity there. If we improve the driving and the behavior and the traffic itself, this is what I would like to call extrinsic uh, efficiency. We have big chance. And to take in a system, if we can explain everything, 
it's kind of a reduction. And this end and this course shows it's explainable by its components. And if you look in traffic system, maybe they are not explainable anymore. I'd like to show the example of intrinsic and extrinsic efficiency if you look into complex and complicated system. Here we have an example. So there are ants, the ants build a bridge, they bring the food home, and the individual ant does not know anything about the bridge. The collaborative individual knows nothing about the bridge, and we see bridges on the right hand side. We see a lot of traffic there, but nothing happens. Only if we change to share the information there, this is the topic I would like to highlight, is the chance to get a better result overall, not the single end which brings a leaf home or a piece of the leaf home, to harvest the leaves. This is what needs the collaboration. Trustfully collaboration and complex and complicated systems is that what gives us emergence. Emergence is something which happens, which is more than the individual parts together. Another example for this is bringing a big piece of food home, three ends. The topic behind this, sharing information. So no of the ends knows what is needed to transport, but altogether they solve a very complex problem. And it's kind of swarming. It's not anymore intrinsic, it's extrinsic. It's working together, collaboration, and exchanging information. This is what we see today, or what we expect, our way to accelerate the CO2 neutrality. We discussed 2050. Can we do it? Maybe not. Maybe not too slow. Maybe not fun, uh, fast enough. So we would need an exponential driver, which gives us the opportunity to get this early majority and the late majority faster in the car, in the collected and the automated mobility. And what you see here is shorten the time. How can we shorten the time? So we need to make it more steep. We need to move this angle ahead. But how can we do this? The question is very simple. Exponential growth and exponential, exponential uh, growth is digitalization. It's a very simple idea. If you share the information with others, the information becomes more valuable. So that, that means you do it in the virtual world you put the information you have together, you share it. And then the simple thing, the simple, I just use here an IoT device is from errors, which says you get information, you have a real time AI intelligence, you build a swarm, and then the machine is as yourself. And out of this independent systems, we have an organization and the organization on the availability of a non-equilibrium uh, will help us to build a system we understand better. We share the information, we get the information, we do better and faster automatization. This is, we have a vehicle, but the vehicle on its own is not the key. Even the city on its own is not the key. What we need is bring person and goods to the place where we want it. We have public transportation vehicles. We have the energy domain. We have emissions, things to consider. But in the city and on the car, we need the edge computing, edge to edge computing. We need the cloud, we need the connectivity and we need the virtualization. So that means to bring these systems together, we need in the shared mobility, the connectivity, sharing the information, sharing and getting back faster to the car itself, interacting with the, inter with the urban environment. And this will reduce the CO2 footprint for the infrastructure and the energy demand. There's a huge potential. 
not anymore in the inverter itself. For sure, we need to develop further inverters, make it standardized, make it more affordable, make it smaller. There's always a way behind. But the point on we need to understand the semantic layer for the ECAS, electric connected, automated and shared, and the future. We would like to have the decarbonization, but we need to do it with the digitalization to get the exponential growth, to get it faster, faster and reduced. Electrification, standardization, automatization is what we did. What we need to do is understand the system now to improve the footprint, the infrastructure together with the energy domain. Therefore, we need connectivity, V2X, V2 everywhere. We need the edge cloud connectivity. More errors, more connections, more independencies or dependency on it. Intrinsic, extrinsic efficiency, we discussed it. So this is something we need to do. We don't need to think anymore too much about what is to improve in the car itself. This will bring us double cost, this is fine, but usability and services. And the way to the services is that what we need. From some percentage to 20 to 30 percentage overall, and for a um, penetration of maybe 50 percent of electric connected and automated chairs in 2030, on the way to the decarbonization in 2050, this will be a huge uh, step ahead. So the interaction between service affordability and usability with the efficiency is the key. And how to do this? So that means we discuss climate neutrality, zero pollution, sustainable transport, transition to a circular economy. We have the Excel MASP. We have many things we discussed. But how to bring the system together, to bring the car on the lower end of our discussion. The vehicle is an IoT, a system on system device, as simple as we see it platform for mobility, for sharing data control and computing resources, functional architecture, built on functional architectures and integration. And with the properties of green propulsion, dependable perception, intelligent platforms and intelligent components. And I put AI in. AI is what we did do in the machines. Then we are able to bring it together. This find the way mobility of as a service in the digitalization in the digital economy forwarding to the Green Deal with all the things we need there as a social optimum, even as a growth function for application services and business models. So the car with electric connected automated autonomous and shared capabilities become the key in the mobility to fulfill the digital economy and the Green Deal. So this was our all enjoy life with less emissions through electri electric mobility. And now the new idea and what we show also in our lighthouse mobility.e is enjoy life and more efficient traffic to electric connected autonomous and shared mobility. So. That's all. Start to think about it, start to discuss it. And I would be very happy if you challenge us with your questions, with your ideas. And even if you say that's all nonsense, please let us know. That's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rainer. There are actually no questions, but there's a comment that I kind of would like to transfer into a question from the audience. The comment is mass mobility is moving back from public to private transportation due to the pandemics. So, I mean, the main idea of your talk is obviously the systemic approach and that at the end to have a cleaner, affordable and, yeah, I guess, also safe mobility we integrated. need like a shared yeah integrated thank you for that we need a shared um yeah 
the shared approach for mobility. So are there any specific ideas how to also approach or to make sure that the, sh the sharing concept is not going to yeah, kind of lag behind now with the um, pandemic? I think the pandemic. The components of a whole system, without forgetting the system, is was the wrong way. So that means a virus, to see a virus without wearing a mask is nonsense. You can discuss a virus and no mask, but uh, by the end, you need to do something to get along with the system, with the challenge. So we need to think, put it together, get an idea together, and also the projects they need the critical mass to think about it. Projects with two or three partners, maybe only five or six, they can do some very specific thing. But if you go along with a system which needs many different aspects, and even what I like to say is um, not to understand all the arguments which support my opinion. We need the arguments they do not support my opinion. What is wrong with us? What can be changed, challenged? What needs to be changed? And this is the point I like to emphasize on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if you start with you start with saying what needs to be changed and challenged. I mean, we you were talking in the presentation about the bigger systemic picture and also how yeah, collaboration and sharing information is yeah the main are the main important things to go ahead. But what I have the feeling normally is that collaboration is relatively easy within the same sector, or also maybe even amongst um, technical different technical um, stakeholders. However, in a bigger mobility picture and in a bigger picture for shared mobility, there are also other stakeholders that need to be included. Of course, the society as a whole, but also, yeah, some more economic factors and legal factors need to be addressed. How do you see that... It, yeah, it can be effectively done to also bring together those different type of stakeholders in a yeah trustful collaboration. That's exactly the point uh, you address here. We need to look for the arguments which do not support our opinion, which gives us by the end the social optimum. We are looking for market optimum. optimum. That's usually the way... Uh, value trends do, systems, uh, like economical systems do. We need to have a balance between what is possible, what is really beneficial for all of us, and what is uh, beneficial only, and make a trade-off between technical development, social development, social understanding, affordability, and acceptance. So what we have in the lighthouse is a look on all of this. We have the non-technical requirements. We have the seven urgent priorities, which are driven by technical understanding, deep dive into the system itself. But now we need to extend really the lighthouse to something which is a lighthouse looking for all of us. And I guess this is uh, the way we do. And I hope this would uh, give you the answer you are asked for. Yeah, thank you very much. I agree with you. We definitely should broaden the stakeholder circle. And as you said, this is already the approach from the Mobility e Lighthouse, and it will yeah, be further focused on that topic. So thank you very much again for your interesting presentation. Then I would like to now welcome Mr. Thomas Kübeck. Mr. Kubek received the diploma degree from the University of Applied Science Regensburg in 2010 and the Bachelor of Honor in Computing Science from 
Staffordshire University in the UK in 2010, as well as a PhD in computing science from the Staffordshire University in 2018. Since 2013, Thomas is working on topics regarding highly automated driving functions, covering all fields from the vehicle design and setup, software architecture, to the evaluation of highly automated driving systems with BMW. And since 2020, he gives a guest lecture. Um, as a guest lecturer, he gives a lecture from for system level verification and validation of automated systems at the Stanford University. And he is also since August 2020, so just very recently, he is working as a leading architect at the Toyota Research Institute for Automated Vehicles of the Future. So welcome, Thomas, and we are looking forward to your speech. Uh, hi, hi, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, um, today um, I would rather give a, a bit of deep dive to actually show what is actually a problem space right now uh, in the state of the art. So basically I want to give a small glimpse uh, about my yeah, former research in smart infrastructure data and what it can do actually for verification validation of automated vehicles. And the importance is the vehicles, because as already said, when it's getting to shared and also connected and, and clever vehicles, um, everything right now is pretty implemented passively. So we definitely need to have a communication to actually have a proactive traffic space. And so I actually talk about the problem cells itself. So basically what is the scenario space and what you can actually um, get out of fleet data or the accuracy of fleet data, then state of the art in, in simulation, because we often mention it, but what does really simulation contribute to the verification and validation space? Uh, a small example and thought um, use case, and then actually a solution, what is still missing and what, what also needs uh, a bit of certification and then more uh, methodology approach, which uh, people should agree on. So I just jump into it regarding times and uh, hope I don't have too many open questions at the end. So basically, what is the scenario? So the, the thing is always um, everyone realizes that, that just driving miles is not the, the key to actually verify, validate uh, ultimate driving function. So um, basically, what, what is really important is um, that you actually can uh, compare and define scenarios. So basically, normally you uh, define a scenario along criticality. So how, um, uh, how how big is the severity? Is it a fender bend in a traffic jam, or is it really severe to the to the occupant if something happens in that situation? The complexity, the right picture is one nice freeway drive is not the same as driving through a construction site, and the occurrence probability. So how often actually happens that? Um, and for example, if we we drive um, to work in the morning, we actually enter the freeway, we merged into the traffic, we maybe have a cut-in scenario, maybe we want to overtake, and then we also actually go into a construction site or drive through a construction site. So the important thing of that is, is all of those are mainly different requirements, and then depending on the level of automation, uh, you want to handle those or not, or even you want to detect it to actually give it back to the driver. So, so you still need to detect it, that is your uh, system boundary in that area. So. And that's uh, pretty interesting. And as you look at the seconds, this is pretty representative first, because when you look at, for example, cut-in scenarios, we have seen a median cut-in takes about seven seconds right now. Um, we have seen Sigma three in up to 14 seconds. So everything happens right now in this requirement domain in, in around um, <laughs> maximum 30 seconds. Um, and then you can rate it, and this way you can actually build up your traffic space and you can analyze your system at the end. So you get a real safety case for, for your evaluation methodology. Um, the thing is now, um, a lot of people are driving around their field operational tests. So this is basically, yeah, it's complicated having a 2D representation of a, of a scenario space. Um, let's say this is the representation what you get when you have a test driver out in the, the field. So hopefully no OEM has ever crashed. We have seen some, but normally they are well-trained um, and you don't see 
uh, critical um, scenarios. Um, and the problem is you not only see those critical scenarios, as you have the sensors on top of your car, they have uh, sensor noises, you don't see the real situation. So if you post-process it, you still need to somehow extract the ground truth of that data. Not only that, as already mentioned, so basically if, if uh, a test driver is driving through a construction site, he might drive on the most right-hand side of the construction site, and this way people are overtaking. So if I'm a really bad driver and I drive sinus uh, curves in a construction site, maybe no one is like, everyone is afraid of, of not overtaking me. So basically, you might never see an overtaking maneuver uh, depending on the driving behavior. So to, to, to emphasize that, human driving behavior is a lot different than actually you are driving around in uh, specific um, scenarios. It's the same if you can drive L4 in Munich, doesn't mean that you can drive L4 in San Francisco or in Shanghai or anywhere else because the dynamic driving patterns are different. On top of that, if you actually introduce uh, automated systems, yeah, you, you actually make up a new space of, of scenarios because uh, automated systems basically normally drive really um, defensive and reactive. And that means that um, looking at the, the scenario distribution, for example, if you have always the same cut-in maneuver, then you have one which is representative, a normal cut-in, what you most of the time see, and then one really slow, long cut-in and maybe some cut-offs, they're really short. Um, when you drive around with your test driver, you only see a small portion of that density function. And the, the thing is, normally you, you have a shift in that density function. If you drive more defensive, you have um, longer time headways and you have um, uh, longer time to collisions and that actually shifts the, the traffic space a bit. Um, and that's somehow we actually want to find out that that, that is the equation we want to, to somehow generate but the problem is it's, it's uh, um, a prediction how the traffic will be and that's normally only effective analysis so is only possible when we actually invest more in simulation and there's the problem because starting with automated driving it's only possible in uh, micro simulations uh, combining to a macro simulation so talking about contribution of simulation um, um, Ideally, yes, we see something in the real world, and then we say, okay, we extract the scenarios and then we re-simulate it. Then we have some KPIs, time to collision, time to react, uh, and everything we have on a system level um, side. And then we derive those KPIs basically, and then we can compare them. The problem is simulation is not always representing the real world. That, that's the main problem. For example, low level sensor fusion is always complex. Everyone knows that. Um, we only can have a small portion reproduced in our simulation environments. Um, and therefore, a small thought space. So we, basically what we have done, we actually did a lot of uh, scenarios and we recorded them on a test track. So SD stands for sensor data. So it's the, the object list and these kind of things, the dynamics that the car actually is seen. So actually we recorded the situation, red is the sensor data, green is the ground truth data, and blue is my ego vehicle. So we did a KPI evaluation, let's say it's a seven from a scale from zero to 10 and 10 is really good. So it's reasonable. So the system itself thinks, yeah, I can still handle it, small deceleration done. So, but we looked then what really happened and we analyzed the green ground truth data. And we have seen that it was a lot more critical because the, the failure was basically in the object prediction and um, it was more critical as the, the car actually is. In it. So what, what, what I've done is next is um, we took the sensor data, generated the scenario, re-simulated, and did a KPI evaluation. So what happened was super surprising. It's a nine. So we thought, okay, we, we sh should do the same with the ground truth. So we extracted the sensor uh, out of the ground truth data scenario. Then we simulated again. And at the end, we again had a nine. And uh, basically that showed uh, when you look at the at the data, um, green is the ground truth of, of the first run. You see that it was pretty critical from a time to rack basis, what we introduced there. And the sensor data, so the car itself doesn't estimate that it's so so crazy. The, the thing was what now happened because we haven't had uh, perception models. 
Um, the sensor data and the re-simulated ground truth data both is the noise of the simulation because the simulation is, has also the timing issues and depending on how your system is being set up, you have a small noise. But uh, what you already see is the shift uh, of seven seconds to 6.5 seconds. And that is the first indicator that actually the system, because of no perception models, has seen the scenario earlier, the cut-in scenario, and therefore could react earlier. And that's something we also see in the data at the end. Uh, when you see the green line, this is the ground truth line, and the red one is the one which our car predicted. And when you see actually um, the most of the noise you normally get in, in, in those automated vehicles in your perception when you actually try to estimate the state, the, the future dynamics of your of the other car, for example, because that is where you actually use, okay, easily speaking, a Kalman filter, or a non-linear non -linear, linear abbreviation of, of, of what is happening right now. So the world is throwing a lot of linearity to your car and kind of people are cutting in and you actually linearize it in your state estimator. And that actually um, brings that overshoot and the undershoot. So you see basically in the turn, we we overestimate, so we think the car is still um, going straight and forward. And then when it cuts on in and it's linear, the filter actually aligns again to the curve. And then again, at the second seven to eight, we already still have a high noise in the system. The interesting portion is now when we actually generated the scenario, which is this light red, we see already that when we extract the scenario, we already have more a ground truth signal because we actually do a interpolation through the position and we extract the velocities out of it. So we increase the signal again. And that's something which really needs to be standardized as well if we want to compare scenarios between different uh, OEMs or tier ones or how we want to do it. So the same thing is, is actually we see here really nice at second four when we look at the dashed ones, which is the re-simulated ones that we a lot earlier see the um, the reaction of the cars and we see the scenario a lot earlier in simulation and therefore we actually react a lot earlier and basically we really change the situation there um, we actually when you look at the heading we overtake instead of actually just decelerate because overtaking in this portion is a more safe maneuver than actually deceleration so we had one of those edge cases where the simulation really changed uh, the scenario category, which is uh, really interesting. So that actually shows uh, the need for perception agent models for simulation. The perception model was clear here because we had actually the noise in our, uh, so we had the ground truth sensor models in our simulation and therefore we need uh, representative noise to actually do also um, a really good um, reproduction of the scenario in our simulation environment. Important is their perception model. I get to that later because that is a lot easier to derive than a sensor model. So what do I mean by that? Agent and perception modeling for increased simulation. What could be a possible methodology for it? So ideally, yeah, we leverage our smart infrastructure data. So I think everyone knows the drone data set, um, which is not that highly accurate and you only have a specific um, environment observability in sense of how long the drone can hoover above a, a freeway and then you still have due to the camera and the, the problem of the distance of your drone, the, the inaccuracies of um, your ground truth data because that's what you actually want to generate. Um, for example, with our um, setup here, the merge, um, we got a accuracy of 30 centimeter in position accuracy, 0 0.1 in meter per second and 0 0.1 in uh, degree heading. Um, that means we are at the round differential GNSS um, grade of, of ground truth data of infrastructure data, which is a, a reasonable, good um, range where you can actually derive a lot of different perception models or agent models. So I get a bit more into the detail there. Um, for example, we have physical models. so. Um, they actually um, try to model physical effects. They have, for example, with ray tracing for LIDAR, or you do electro wave propagation with, uh, with ray tracing as well. Um, therefore, you need a lot of high fidelity simulation environments, what we don't have, and it's still a research part for the next five to 10 years. 
And uh, simulating low performance, for example, in rain for LIDAR with glass and everything, it's pretty complicated, which is the same for phenomenological models. So basically, this is just um, multiple phenomena have impact uh, onto your system. For example, you have rain plus a window or rain and you drive outside a tunnel or light and you drive outside a tunnel. And that is uh, or you light outside tunnel and into rain. That is that would be the, the craziest one, uh, and therefore it's the same like physical models for pheno phenomenological models. Normally, you need also a good quality of physical modeling. Then we would have statistical models. Um, that's just simply input output. But as we have seen, that wouldn't have the right impact for nonlinearity in your systems. And we have seen the simple models is actually not. Uh, representative. Um, so we introduced something which is a, a maneuver-based statistical model. So we really cut out of those scenarios the maneuvers and train basically in an imitation learning approach the sensor models. And, and why I'm saying that, we, we published all of this because I think this method really needs to standardize if, for example, one OEM is extracting data and gives the scenario to someone else, says this is the ground truth data or plus a variance, what, how you have seen it. And then you want to actually have your um, maneuver-based statistical model to actually drive that scenario as well and see if your system can cope it. And this way you would have a cumulative scenario-based approach over multiple um, OEMs, tier ones, whoever is in that field. So how it works? how that works is, is, is as described, we have measurements, we extract the ground truth data, um, and as we have the sensor data of the car, we can actually train between ground truth data and sensor data and the perception model along the maneuvers. And the next step, we can actually use the scenario, integrate the perception model and do the re-simulation. The importance here is that the scenario is the base for a perception model, because uh, normally you want to have uh, pre-calculations that the simulation is actually knowing what happens in the future. You need to somehow derive those uh, dynamics. So it's, it's good that we actually covered uh, the sensor model space, um, but it's the same still. Um, how do you get actually from the human traffic space to human traffic space plus our system? Um, and that is something which is still a bit missing. Um, we, we actually need to derive um, agent data for, for, for our simulation or, or train agents which actually represent the, the real traffic data. And why we have found that actually um, infrastructure data is, is, is so good because actually you get a, a lot of directories from not highly automated driving test vehicles. So you get really the, the traffic of the, the human driving behavior at a specific place. So you can really derive with analytics, how do people cut in, how do people merge? So you have no traffic influence of your car, you have a efficient data collection because you look at merges or you look at the edge cases. You have a really high improved data accuracy. As said, we have 30 centimeter accuracy in position, 0.1 in velocity and 0.1 degree in heading. And um, the good thing is that you can also use it um, for generation of sensor data. For example, if uh, OEM drives through infrastructure and you give him a, a ground truth, um, snippet of, of his test drive, then you still can use that um, to actually help him to derive the, the necessary models. So basically what we did then for the agent models is um, we actually did an object detection a radar camera fusion. We transformed that and, and uh, stored the tracks. Um, this is how it actually worked. So um, we also did the same with our test run to actually analyze how actually how accurate the system is. So we, we actually drove with our car through it, had a DGPS of our position, and then we de detected with our infrastructure, our car, and uh, there was also a DGNS module. So we could really uh, derive the, the error of our measurement unit on, for example, a bridge or wherever you want to actually deploy it. So with then a lot of different methods I have, uh, few slides in the backup if someone has some detailed questions in there. Um, you can actually do um, really good imitation learning and then you can derive agents and um, you actually can then 
run your AD functions in the simulation and do the testing in that area. So this is how it actually looks. So you have a lot of scenarios, you add it to your simulator. Um, you have a perception model of your system that's some that's really dependent on your car, on your AD function, on your system setup. So hardware, software, software config, and these kind of things. And the agent model in that scenario, because you actually want to have reaction of, of real traffic behavior if your car is actually, your AD function is behaving differently. And this is how you can actually derive activity analysis, how actually would be a specific um, freeway snippet um, included with a black box AD function of OEM 1, B, 2, or 3. Um, yeah, so um, sorry for maybe it was a bit uh, fast or not, but um, I think most of the things are already standard. So scenarios, we have an open scenario, um, and also the interfaces from simulator to the AD function is done with the open simulator interface. So basically, ASM is pretty strong in that area, but what is still missing is a common uh, methodology in agree standard for perception modeling and agent modeling because those are the at least a methodology to actually derive same perceptions models to actually simulate and the agent models are important that everyone is actually working on the same basis that we can compare different functions and derive this orange how do we shift our traffic is it getting more safe is it getting more traffic jam is it getting um, is it getting better? Do we get better TTCs, THVs, which we definitely think we get? So yeah, to answer all the societal um, impact, what we actually need. So yeah, I think that was um, the most of it. I still have some backup slides. If we have some time for questions, then I am happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Unfortunately, I think we are not able to have some questions right now because we are directly at the end of our session. However, I yeah, I would like to shift maybe the discussion also into the afternoon workshop session if there are any um, additional questions. And with this, I would like to thank all of the speakers for the sharing of your views with us and obviously i also want to thank the audience for the attention and i finally would like to draw again your attention to the co-located workshop of the mobility e lighthouse this afternoon at 3 30. the workshop will start with the presentation of challenges of engineering safe and secure highly automated vehicles and then it will be followed by a uh, interactive expert consultation on research priorities and research actions to accelerate the deployment of ECAR mobility. So I hope to see many of you later at 3.30 in our co-located workshop.